We are obviously in an ongoing study regarding the lost tribes, and I told you I was going to try and dial it back a bit. I lied. <laughs> I can't help myself. That's the problem. You know, when you're dealing with this really incredible subject, what's thrilling to me is we're looking at what so many for so long, not those that were researching this, but those on the outside said, no, those are just crazy ideas. It couldn't be. But when you start to look at the evidence, the breadcrumbs through archaeology, through the historical writers of antiquity, you begin to see that it is impossible for this to just be some mere mythological, back in the pages of somebody's mind, a great fascinating tale. It's impossible. The goal here, as I said, I've already alluded to, is to follow each of the tribes to ascertain when God made the promise to say your descendants will be as the sand uh, and as the stars in the sky. You cannot count them. This could never be the people that modern day refer to as Jews. It could not be. They do not make up that populace. There is not the number there for that. And there is equally, my frustration is in a lot of printed matter where you have genius contributions to this subject, but they fail to distinguish between the split house, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, which then blends into this making some of these people who will no longer be attached to their former customs, but they will not be and they could never be Jewish by any means, by any way, by any form. So we need to be clear on this. So I bring you to a strange group of people, not lost tribes again, but important because they will help fill in the blanks as we build the background for Dan. The Philistines. Now, please listen carefully because I know there are people in the listening audience that don't listen carefully and they will blend Phoenicians and Philistines. They are two distinct people, okay? And I uh, trust me, when I'm done with this, you'll know why they are very separate and distinct. So the Philistines, if you remember weeks ago, I, I said, I'll tell you about certain people. The Philistines were one, sometimes called the Sea Peoples. You ever heard that term, the Sea Peoples? You're reading something, says the Sea Peoples. Okay, Sea Peoples is a, a term that encompasses a bunch of, we'll call it a confederation of peoples from different tribes, but definitely the Philistines make up part of the Sea People. So if you're trying to look up and do research, just be cognizant that this is not referring to one group of people. But the Philistines, if we look at the area where they took root in the early Iron Age one, the inhabitants of their area have a very strong colonizing ability, but something that I think is super important, which is a very strong Aegean, that is the area, we'll call it Greece, okay, for a generic term, the, they have a very strong Aegean influence on obviously things like their pottery, not just in type, but in the way it's produced. There's a whole history of studying the different types of pottery and shards that are found. So we can know by, by the type of pottery, by the type of design, who, whose handiwork it is. So there's this great influx for them of Aegean works in their architecture, in their city planning. But archaeologically, something happens in the late Bronze Age, which we're going to put at about 1200 to 1150 BC, somewhere in that ballpark, we see something very strange happened with these people. I'm going to use some terms and I'll explain. The Pentopolis, Pente Five, and Polis City, the five cities of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Ashdad, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza, make up the area that we would label the people of the Philistines living in Philistia, all right? But we can see something happen in the archaeological study. We can see that a new culture of people came in, overwhelmed the inhabitants, brought with them unrelated customs, and it transformed the Bronze Age. And this may not be really important for the general public type listener, but if you're going to do some digging, 
after I share these things. Some of you have gone on to do research and look up, and I've told you, knock yourselves out. It's one of the most wondrous things. No matter what I'm teaching on, I always encourage people to do research and look things up for yourselves. But we know from the Bible, we know that these Philistines, first and foremost, you know the terminology, sometimes you've heard somebody say, oh, you're just a Philistine. You know, that's supposed to mean that you're uncultured, right? That actually is an erroneous interpretation of these people. They were actually highly cultured and had such advanced technology and military might. I think we have adopted that term erroneously, perhaps. But when we look at the Bible, we have this kind of what leaps out in your mind when you think Philistine. For me, the first thing is the young David and the giant Goliath. There is your first we'll call it encounter with the Philistines. Uh, if you're even a child, you know you would remember David taking down the, the giant Goliath Philistine. The most famous, we'll call it, person that they took down in the Bible, if you will, was a Danite, Samson, basically who was overcome, if you know the story, and I don't think I need to recap, but the Philistines brought him down. You think about that. And then their claim to fame, which I love. You'll find this story in 1 Samuel. These people actually stole the ark of God. And if you kind of piece all this together, it's kind of radical that we tend to maybe, again, caricature these people, but they were very much involved in kind of everyday life. At least through the Pentateuch, we see a lot of references. In fact, their ethnicon, their their name appears around 250 times in the Old Testament. That's quite substantial. That means something of relevance. We have something that will help us, though. When we begin to look at some of their kings, there are two that stand out. One, if you remember, would be the king of Gath. Remember where David feigned himself uh, crazy a little bit? That's one. And the other one are a mention of Ekron's kings, Ikausu, who is the son of Paddy. And you might say, well, what, what, is, what does that have to do with me? Well, I'll explain in a minute that Ikasu's name, actually, when we begin to translate it back into a normal stream, could come to mean something like Greek, like as in nationality, not language, OK? So this will open up the door for us to try and understand what is this connection. If you're an old timer here, you probably have a lot of books by the late, great Cyrus Gordon. And one of those books has that he wrote prolifically on that a lot of people just dissed him for, which was the connection between the Greeks and the Hebrews. If you have that book, take it out, reread it. It's worth it while we're on this subject. Very enriching. And I think his work was a stellar contribution to this field in particular. So. During the reign of Ramses III, a confederation of tribes from the islands of the north countries begins to attack, making their way towards Egypt by sea. Actually, there were land people and sea people. And we know this because there is a mortuary inscription at a temple. It's called Midnet Habu. And the inscription refers to a particular people, one of many sea peoples are chronicled here, called the Pulisati or the Peliset, Philistines, all right? A lot of times when we're reading the Bible, we're looking at the anglicized version of something. Go back into the original, and you'll see even if you go into the Hebrew of the Old Testament, a lot of the words do not look like our English, all right? So don't say, well, how could that be? These people are recognized on this inscription as one of many tribes that traversed the eastern sections of the Mediterranean, sacking and destroying much in their path. It seems like all these people had a habit of doing that. The most famous place that they sacked and is chronicled again is Ugarit. And what's interesting is not in the Egyptian chronicles, but in the chronicles that we could glean from Ugarit. The king, whose name was Amurabi, not Amurab, not Hammurabi, Amurapi, made a call to any 
any person in the sound of his voice, by letter, by sea, by land, for assistance, knowing these people were headed his way. But the call fell on deaf ears, and of course, this attack is chronicled, the Philistines and their confederate group, known as the Sea People, chronicled in the historical records as taking place in 1192 BC. Now, why I love this is because, you know, if we didn't have certain inscriptions, and if we didn't have, we, as I have operated, by faith, you take the, the word at God's word, you say, well, by faith I accept it. But when you've got a lot of these other pieces of information, you're hard pressed to not go back and read certain events and say, this happened. Whether you like it or not, there are some people that just would they'll keep pressing the matter. I probably get one of these a week saying, the Bible can't be true. Well, okay, good for you. You know, you're entitled to your opinion, and it's your opinion. So there is also a relief at the Egyptian temple. And what is fascinating, you can look this up online, it is a relief of these sea people, the Egyptians, mind you, History is usually strangely warped, especially when the winning side is writing it, they'll embellish. So there is a depiction of the sea battle, and you can kind of get a, an idea of what these people, even if it is small, what they may have looked like. It's kind of fascinating. Of course, the Egyptians won, and suffering a terrible defeat, many of these sea people ended up on land, settling in the south coast of Canaan. Now, you might say, what is the connection? Where did these Philistines come from? Who are they? Hold that thought. Open your Bible. Go to the 10th chapter of Genesis. Genesis 10 basically is the record of the descendants of all those in the family of Noah, his children and their children's children, and so on. So when you read, I'll go one verse before what I'm looking at, Genesis 10, 13. One verse before, and Mizraim, which is usually interpreted Egypt, begat Ludim, and Enanim, and Lehabim, and Neftuhim, and Pathrusim, and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim, and Kaftorim. Now remember, you studied Hebrew with me, the im at the end is plural, right? So Kaftor is actually, we know, is Crete. And don't think, well, wouldn't Crete be part of Javan and these other places? Remember, it's an island. And before things become identified as territorial later on, they are islands. So Kaftor is Crete. And I can show you this somewhere else. So this is not an independent observation. First, let me read to you. You don't have to turn there. If you don't want, just jot it down in case you want to check out what I'm saying. One of the appearances is in Amos 9 and verse 7, where it says, Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaftor? So it is there, all right? But then, more importantly, if you turn to Jeremiah 47, there it's kind of, it's inescapable. It kind of, it, it recaps what I just shared with you about Pharaoh's battle with these people, which if you didn't know what it was, now you know what Jeremiah 47 is referring to. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against the Philistines before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. And thus saith the Lord, behold, waters rise up out of the north, and shall be an overflowing flood, and shall overflow the land, and all that is therein, the city, and them that dwell therein, and the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl, at the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his strong horses, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of his wheels, the fathers shall not look back on to their children for feebleness of hands, because of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines, and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon, those two cities we looked at and mentioned last week, every helper that remaineth. For the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. There you have it. So you might say you have enough information right now to make the connection. And this is why when I said, I will refer to this shortly in my message, but the archaeological evidence from the Aegean 
found in the settlements in those five cities is striking. So you can kind of start connecting the dots a little bit. There was, there have been a whole series of excavations from Ashkelon primarily, which is one of those five cities I mentioned of the Philistine territory. They found infant graves dating back to the 12th century and another burial ground with other remains in it dating to the 8th century BC. I won't get into the details and I will explain DNA at the close of the message, but DNA analysis staggeringly confirms that the remains found at these Philistine grave sites lead you back to Crete. So think on that. It's pretty interesting. If you're interested in, pardon the pun, digging for more, uh, one of my absolute favorites is the late, great Trudy Dothan. She was truly a pioneer in her field. Not only was she a field expert where she actually did digs and her work on this is plastered everywhere, her books. She was a great contributor at the Hebrew University. I can go on and on and on, but if you want more information on the finds there, that's where I'd point you in the direction to look first and foremost. And wherever I can, I'm going to provide those pieces of information for people who earnestly just want to follow up. Or you'd, like, you'd like to see, for example, there are great pictures online that come from digs in this area starting at about 1960 on through the late 90s, clear on to today. But pictures where you can see pottery, you can see all of these. And it, it actually, it's like putting flesh and bone. You're putting some substance together. And now the pictures, the visual part of it, just kind of puts it over the top. So hopefully you will investigate on your own. If not, that's OK, too. So remember, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the connection between, remember, we looked at last week Phoenicians, we're looking at the Philistines, and, and how does the tribe of Dan tie into the Philistines? Remember, I just mentioned the Sea People, and I said it's a confederation of people, different tribes. So the Egyptian sources mention a people called the Denyen, or the Denuna, or the Danunu. No doubt a derivative of the famed Danans, also called people of the islands or isles, Dan. So now I'm thinking, right, right now is a good time to do this. There are people who are probably just tuning in going, huh, what? So the subject is lost tribes. You may feel like you're lost. That's OK. But let me just take a second to recap, because in my recap, it will bring us back to another point. So just for the benefit of those tuning in right now, we are tracing the biblical descendants of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. We know that Jacob, this will be like a one-minute review. Jacob had many sons and daughters, but particularly we're focused on the sons, by two wives, which were actually two sisters, and their respective concubines. And we know that the woman he truly loved, Rachel, was barren, so she gave her handmaid to produce offspring, and of that, of that handmaid, whose name is Bilhah, comes Dan, one of the many children. Now, I just said, Jacob, whose name, is, whose name gets changed to Israel, not the land, a person, all right? And he will pass on his name to his children as the children of Israel. And then we have all the tribes in their respective groups. So now, long before Moses is born, we know that these children of Israel, along with their patriarch Jacob, will go into Egypt, not into bondage, but basically they'll be spared from certain death that would have been a famine in the land. And they stay in that land, which is called Goshen, becoming prosperous, multiplying, numerous. They also, we know this for a fact, they become so prosperous that in the land that they're ruling, they are referred to as shepherd kings. And it is Manetho, the historian, who first refers to these people as the Hyksos. But these are a ruling class of people before they go into bondage. So 
Later, God will obviously orchestrate the thing he prophesied through Abraham. They will, all of these children of Israel, most of them, not all, will go into Egypt's bondage because the scripture says there rose up a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, and then they are in bondage until the time that God raises up Moses, the deliverer, to bring them out of that land and into the promised land. Now, wow, that was a rapid recap. So this is where we're at. The important thing is that in the Egyptian records, we have a name that keeps popping up. And that name is Yekeb Baal, like Baal. That is referencing Jacob. So whether they called him Ye Jacob Lord, meaning as in a man, the Lord of the house, or whether they deified him, it's not certain to me. But it, this, this name may help us to connect some dots, believe it or not, to these people and their descendants, Dan. So hold that thought for just a second, because a lot of, your, if, especially if you're reading helps and books, you're going to encounter a name, Bellus, B-E-L-U-S, which is supposedly offspring and related somehow to Dan, and I'll explain there may be good reason to believe that Belus is actually Baal, but not the Baal, Baal, but a relative or the concept of a descendant of Yekeb Baal, of Jacob's descendants. So keep that in mind. Very important. Now we know as we start following these people, we need every breadcrumb we can get. That's why I just put this in in passing. We know that as I mentioned last week, the Phoenicians had incredible shipbuilding skills. We know their commerce, we know everything, but do not, do not discount that this group of people, Denyen, referring to other sea people, undoubtedly part of Dan, who most likely defected before the children of Israel went into Egypt's bondage, not all of them, a small portion, and we will look at this again in greater detail, but it would explain how these people had knowledge of seafaring. Because remember, I just referenced to you that the Philistines, referring to as sea people, came with other people. So whether they independently had their ships or not at this point, I cannot say. I can only say that we know there is a part of Dan that is in this equation, just based on the terminology of Denyen, as one of the sea people, which takes us right back to Dan. Now, stop right there. This is where it gets a little freaky, and I need you to really bear down with me. For whatever the reason, a lot of people kind of coil back at this idea. We have to actually look into Greek mythology, and there's a reason to do it. You see, we can trace Greek history back to a certain time legitimate history, real history, all right? And then at a certain time, it's almost as though that history ceases, the credible, true historical record ceases, and a blur, we'll call it an amalgam of tales, real people, and possible history all get mushed up into what we call mythology. If you're not willing to look at this and see through it, you will miss a lot. And let me point this out in another way so it maybe makes a little bit more sense. We read the Bible and we read about the chronicle of the flood, whether the flood was local or global, doesn't matter, a flood occurred. Go into other ancient records and somehow you will find each of these ancient records from other cultures has a reference to a flood. Look at the Gilgamesh epic. You've got so many different types of cultures repeating the great flood, the names of people change, the area may change, but there is, we'll call it this uh, common denominator thread of a flood that occurred. So we have to, at some point, give credence to the fact that some of these, some of these biblical stories have been orally transmitted and then into other cultures, whether it is by perversion that is intended or whether it is by broken telephone but, or maybe that culture adopts 
this very tale, but they end up putting their own spin on it. And it sounds a little bit different, but the common denominator of the flood is there. So to discount every historical, forgive me for saying it like that, but the records we have of antiquity, even if they seem to be fabricated, is not a very good system, especially if we're playing time detective. We need every help we can get. So when I take you to, and I'm going to read from some Greek mythology today, I don't want you to think that I'm introducing this because it's fanciful. It actually may help us to understand that some of these mythological people are not actually who we really think they are, but they're other people. I digress for a second before I get to the book. You've all heard of Hercules, correct? Okay. Hercules is actually the Latinized name of Heracles. And if you know what Hercules is famous for, say it in one word. Y'all said it, strength. Now, if you take a look at, and there's a, um, a wonderful helps, the Encyclopedia of, classical, uh, of the Classical World, and, and I'm going to quote exactly what the author, unfortunately I didn't write down the author, so I will do that for future too. I always give credit when I'm reading or quoting. The tales of his heroic deeds lends to the supposition that Hercules was originally an historic figure. Now, why do I say that? Because I'm going to show you some parallels. Hercules, for example, escapes the grips of a woman who is called Pleasure. This is a parallel to biblical Samson, all right? Samson is known for his strength, and one of the things that Samson does, according to the Bible, is he rips a lion in two with his bare hands. Josephus later says he first strangled it, and then he ripped it in two. How Josephus knows that, I don't know. But if you're reading the account of Heracles, or Hercules, one of the 12 feats that he accomplishes is indeed the rending of a lion. And there are just way too many parallels between the biblical Samson. Now, add this into your little equation here. Samson is a Danite from the tribe of Dan. So imagine if you were from this line, you might sail off into another land and bring with you the oral traditions and the telling of, and maybe it's transmitted or right the first time, maybe it's so already corrupted by the time it's transmitted for the first time. I'm giving you hypothesis. But in any case, it's brought to a foreign land where inhabitants there may take up, and somehow now we have a different character, similar concepts. So when you get to Greek mythology, be very careful because we may find that there are kernels of truth embedded in these mythological depictions, if you will. Something else that's kind of interesting. Remember, I just said the connection between Hercules and Samson. Now, we know that Samson's downfall was women, not just one, but there were a couple at the beginning, and then it just kind of goes downhill from there. What's interesting is if you look to Hercules' history, he was married to a woman who I'm not really sure that it's her name, but it bothered me because I read that this woman's name is Hebe, not Hebe-Jebe, but Hebe, <laughs> and not Hebe. <laughs> Try that one on for size. No. But Hebrew, think on that for a little bit. There's some wild stuff here that if you just you think about it, I'll tell you another one that's kind of interesting. You have British archaeologist Arthur Bernard Cook, way back then, he equated the mythological Poseidon with Dan by way of translation. You might say, how is that? Well, he translated Poseidon as Pote Dan, and he probably was not far off because the Doric word for this was, I should write it out, but def, defon or dawan, which is water. And then you get into the earliest attested understanding decipherment of linear B as po se da o, po se da one, and being interpreted master of the waters. Well, think of it this way. I would say the master of the waters would have been the Phoenicians or the Philistines, but it could have 
been placed on to one descendant from the tribe of Dan. Just think about that for a minute. Also that Poti Dan, there's your Poseidon. Remember, we're going to find the name is slapped everywhere. Dan, Din, Don. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, okay? That's the important message before I read this. There's something else which is not a coincidence. And that is in the geographical area where we find Dan or Danus, the activity in the Peloponnesus seems to be the core area where the mythological Poseidon emerged. So you begin to tell me whether you think that's just mere speculation or there's more probability behind what I'm saying. So I am a big believer in the fact that much of Greek mythology has vestigial remnants of people who actually existed, who become so blown out of proportion. I don't know if you remember, but the late Dr. Scott taught on Zeus and Jupiter, Zeus being the Greek god and Jupiter being the equivalent, same god. The Romans just stole the god and put a different name on him. Same god, okay? So then you begin to trace Zeus and Jupiter back and you get much surprised at what the references are about. That, that's for another message. I'm trying to dangle a little bit. <laughs> All right, I am reading from the Illustrated Dictionary of Greek and Roman Mythology, Michael Stapleton. And this wonderful work kind of has a great, we'll call it a, just a whole bunch of information. So first I want to read to you about Danis. And if you have been following what I've been saying, or if you have been doing your own research, or you remember this from 20 and 30 years ago, whatever it is, try and keep an open mind. Some of this is, some of this you know is just, wow, nut, nut stuff, all right, crazy, embellishment from somewhere else, but some of this is concrete and absolute. So on the, on the subject of Danis, Danis, the brother of Egyptus, which by the way, Egyptus is mean, meaning Egypt, the name, the name would represent that, and the son of Belus, which remember I brought that into the equation, is attached back perhaps to Baal. No one knows, but there's good speculation for that. Danis was a descendant of Zeus by his union with Io. After a quarrel with his brother over their inheritance, Egyptus suggests the marriage of his 50 sons to the 50 daughters of Danis. Danis did not like the proposal, neither did his daughters and consulted an oracle, which confirmed his uneasiness by revealing that Egyptus intended to destroy him and his family. So Danis and his daughters fled on a ship that took them by way of Rhodes to Lerna in Argos. Now, remember what I'm saying here, because this is going to come up somewhere else as a documented fact, the fact that they came by way of Rhodes. The king of Argos, Gelinor, gave Danis his throne, not because he liked him, but because an event occurred that seemed to guide him to it. This whole section I don't need to read. It's a lot more crazy stuff. I'll tell you straight up when I think it's crazy stuff. A wolf came down from the mountain and ate a child or something, and the child ends up being something else. Okay, fast forward, right? You get the point. Danis built a shrine when he became king and dedicated it to Apollo, convinced that this wolf that had come down from the mountain was sent by Apollo. He also sent out to cure the drought which was plaguing Argos and sent his daughters in search of the countryside for new springs and streams. One of the girls was saved from rape by a satire by the timely arrival of the god Poseidon. Now, just keep that in mind. Remember what I said in light of Potidan. The kingdom of Danis was not yet secure. Egyptus had not given up. He sent his 50 sons to Argos to pursue the marriage project, which was that the 50 daughters of one would marry the 50 sons of the other. The plan did not go through. Uh, they besieged the citadel of Argos, and Danos found himself cut off from the precious water of Lerna. Danos finds out this plan and instructs his daughters to kill the husbands. Nice. Uh, but I guess it was either kill or be killed. One daughter does not comply. She does not kill her husband. And this one escapes, and we have a whole spin-off from that escapee. And then here's what's interesting. The other daughters for their crime were condemned to spend after their afterlife in Tartarus carrying water in perforated jars. 
I think that's a, that would be a good punishment for some of our leaders in the state of California. <laughs> Hold that thought, though. <laughs> Not done with this. Now, why is this important? Remember, when I started reading this, it says, Danis was a descendant of Zeus. Now, do you remember way back when I started this, I said, a lot of confusion, people conflate names. And the name Dardanus, remember, in our Bible, First Chronicles talks about the descendants of Zara, Chalcol, and Darda. Remember that. So Dardanus, according to Homer, the founder of Troy. So I'm trying to show you that Danus and Dardanus are actually within mythology and also within the records are two distinct people. They are not one and the same. That's very important because most people writing on this conflate the two. They are not the same people. So... Dardanus is the son of Zeus, different than Danus, who is a descendant. Here, Dardanus is the son of Zeus, uh, and he founded Dardania, as there was no city yet. Dardanus' son goes on to be the richest king on earth, and this whole thing leads us basically to the history of the descendants of that line heading off to Italy at a later time. So when I say to you that there's bits and pieces that we can glean, don't, don't just discount when you start reading this to say, well, that's just, it's mythology. And as I said, actually, I have a little bit more, I think, to read to you from somewhere else. Yes, here. So if you look up in the same book, Io, which is, remember, I read that she is the daughter and given in marriage and whatnot. Uh, in her chronicles, it says that she was eventually taken to Egypt where Zeus restored her to her true shape. She was turned into a cow. Every woman's dream. <laughs> then she gave birth to his son, Epaphus. And by the way, Epaphus is so associated with Apis, the Egyptian bull god. The ancestor of Danis and Egyptus. So Epaphus, not the bull god, but the person, becomes the father of Libya, the traditional name for Africa outside of Egypt. So, you know, when you think you can't glean from something like this, you can, because I'm not so sure that people were turned into cows or bulls, or you have at least the tidbits there to say in a, in a vestigial realm, undoubtedly there is connections to historical personages. Let me get back to what we're doing here. If you take all this information and we have other pieces that will start to come together. Remember I mentioned Cadmus. Remember Cadmus brought the alphabet to, we'll call it the area, the Aegean, uh, the area of Crete or Thebes. Remember that. And Phoenix, who is a brother, will become the father according to these legends who will become the father of the Phoenicians and eventually will extend, of course, Phoenicia will extend to Carthage and we keep going on. If you are familiar with the writer Virgil in his Aenid, he calls the city of Carthage the city of Agnor, which is one of these relatives coming out of Phoenicia. Now, we'll trace all of this, but there are things that come up when you start digging that you say, well, I, I don't know what to make sense of this, what to do with this. But we do know this, if we take enough of the information from what I just read, if we take enough of the information from other historical writers like Herodotus, he brings up something kind of radical that will bring the point back. Egyptians in a place called Shemis, which is Akmim, also known at one time as Panopolis, they had taken the custom of the Greeks where they worshipped Persis. Very unusual. Herodotus asked why, and they said that Persis was given to them by descent, by Danus, who had been a Shemite, don't think Semite, a Shemite, a, an inhabitant of Egypt, before his departure to Greece. And that is the record of Herodotus. So we now are starting to get confirmation to see that these people originated in the land of Goshen, in the land of Egypt, and migrated. And we're looking at the pieces that 
are all being put together. What's mind-boggling is that the Egyptians and the Greeks both accept this common history. If you talk to most people, especially Greek people, they are very fond of their mythology. In fact, I got an earful of a lot of it while I was there. No one wants to hear, and I don't think, you know, it's kind of like what, what Jack said, you can't handle the truth. I don't think people could handle the truth. The fact of the matter is that you have people who then they are not the people you think they are. So one might ask, is there any other proof of what you're saying beyond Herodotus, beyond Manetho, beyond even mythological conjecture? The answer is yes. There is a marble stone called the Parian stone. And Parian is famous, by the way, it's famous for the marble that much of for example, I was on the island of Delos, which is purportedly the home of Apollos. But much of the marble there was Parian marble. There is a stone. You should research this at your own discretion. But there is a reference, basically, whoever chronicled this, what's interesting is that this individual writing was an archon on the Isle of Paros. What's interesting is that I stopped by that island, beautiful quaint town and you know very touristic, you'd never think in a million years, but all of these places contain information for us to kind of put flesh and blood on all this. So this particular stone reveals a timeline from the first king of Athens until dating down till about the year 263, giving more or less a ballpark of important events. And one of these important events is Danis's arrival from Egypt to Greece, specifically in the Argolid, a stone's throw away from Crete, in 1511 BC. That's mind boggling. And let me tell you why. Because there's a great debate over when the Exodus occurred out of Egypt. Most of you who tried to figure this out know there's several dates out there. This date could fit nicely, sorry to say it like this, but it could fit nicely with pre-Exodus, no problem, but it doesn't matter. It's early enough in the chronicles of history to know that this date would be solid enough to put the defection of these people from land to sea at about this timeline. Not only that, the record goes on, this stone goes on to give details of the fact that he arrived by way of Rhodes. Now, I, I also have a, a wild theory. It's mere speculation. So don't, don't look this up and say, I haven't found what you're saying. But my theory is that when Dennis was making his way, I believe they stopped and they settled at Thera. And a whole settlement was there. And as you know, there was great volcanic activity. And coupled that with an earthquake, you have nothing left. They flee there, and they set up shop at a neighboring island. Very tenable, very plausible. We'll come back to that, perhaps. I'm simply putting some ideas there. And as I said, if you go online and do a little bit of research, you begin to see all of this is more than not just tenable, plausible, speculation, but more likely it happened this way. The stone also tells us something else, and this is the mind-boggling one. It tells us that the manner of transportation in which Danis arrived, this is, this is the one that blows my mind. He arrived in something called a pente conter, pente for 50, 50 oars, a boat with 50 oars. Please, at your leisure, look something like this up online and Please tell me that this is just something fanciful. These are serious ships. And by the time you see what these look like, we're talking about something that would be at least 100 feet long. Now, nowadays, you see boats that are 100 feet long, and that's no big deal. But back in that day, the wood and the craftsmen to build that, and then you have to make sure that it stays afloat, right? So. Uh, I'm trying to tell you, this is on this stone, and it's kind of, it almost gives you the idea of imagining. And as I said, I was on that body of water, and I kept imagining how 
they could have navigated without all the modern tools, considering I saw rocks, as I said, sharp rocks, jetting up from the middle of nowhere. However, you know, a lot of people make the mistake and say by the time that Magellan and Columbus were navigating, they had better tools, better maps. Well, no, these people, by this time, would have been aware of fixed points in the sky, including the appearance of the bright star of the constellation of Ursa Minor, which is a fixed date if you look, if you're into the stars. By 1400 BC, it becomes a fixed concept for people to follow navigationally. So there is good information, and then add to it, the same stone that says that Danis arrived in 1511 also says Cadmus arrived in that general area in 1519 BC. So when you start to see solid dates, you start to think, this is not just some, hmm, I think maybe. We're looking at history that breadcrumbs all put together may actually make up a loaf of bread for us to sit down and really take a hard look at. There's one other noteworthy thing. As I said, Cadmus, it is recorded that he founded Thebes. What is interesting is that I think it is Homer, don't, get, don't quote me on this, it could be Homer, it could be Herodotus, I'm not sure where I read this, notes that the people on Thebes are not called Thebians, they were referred to as Cadmians. That's another radical thing, sons of Cadmus. So think on that. That area, by the way, has a very rich history up until the time of Alexander the Great, and then obviously it, it succumbs to a whole host of conquerors until it is the Byzantine area saw it flourish. There was a large, actually, Jewish community there for a time in the 12th century, and then we have AD, and then we have the Turkish occupation, which lasts about 400 years. So it seems like everybody wanted to claim to this particular area. In fact, what I saw when I was in that area is visible everywhere. We have castles that were, you can tell, originally built by one group of people, some of them destroyed and some of them built back up by other people. We know by virtue of their architecture, who built them, how they did it. It's pretty fascinating if you're into that stuff. If you're not into that stuff, I'm boring you to tears. Now, I'm going to start tying this all together. Most of us have heard of the term when we read in Greek legend or in Greek history, of the League, the League of, it's not the League of Nations in modern sense, but a group of islands that teamed together, and there were 12 of them, Rhodes being the biggest one of them all. And in the Greek language, they would call, there was a term for this in the Peloponnesus. Remember, this is all the area of activity that would have had some ancient idea of transmission from ancient cultures, maybe not remembering in part, but some of these fragmented things carried forward. This league is called the Dodecanese, which what's interesting is that simply being the 12, but this term will be used specifically, and it'll morph into something else, but it'll be specifically used by the Greeks to denote the 12 tribes of Israel. Think on that. That's kind of one of those radical things. Again, everything here, if you're not sure, please go look it up. I have, as I said, I have no problem in you looking because that's how we, we grow and we have become to better understanding. And if you're not into that, as I said, you'll just have to take my word. Now, what does all of this have to do in the big picture? If you remember last week and possibly the week before, I spoke about DNA and used a word called haplogroup. And I had a request to make clear what this means. So I will do this now because in future, I want this to be understood by all. It's very simple. I'm giving you the most simplistic. It, it's, it's not as simplistic as I'm presenting it, but it's the most simplistic way to describe this. DNA starts with two concepts, two starting points, the Y-DNA, which basically is the man, and MT-DNA, which is the woman. Ironically, a lot of these charts that you will find online are produced by people who do not believe in God, but right next to the Y-DNA, it says Adam, and MT-DNA says Eve. Well, you think about that. <laughs> now, imagine a tree. The Y and the MT-DNA, they both sit at the top of the tree. 
And as you descend into the branches, on the male side there are 18 branches, and on the female side there are 26 branches. And each of these branches is distinguished by letters and numbers. On the male side, I believe it's A through R, and on the female side, A through Z, with numbers. Do not think that these distinguish anything other than what I said, DNA. So we can know when we talk about a haplogroup, haplo means singular or simple as opposed to compound. A haplogroup is a single grouping identified by their DNA. And let me just put in here as a parenthetical sidebar. And some people will not like what I'm going to say, but again, I'm not the scientist behind this. I'm simply the reporter passing this on. It's very clear that even if you were looking at DNA, you would see that it is impossible to simply have Y DNA or MT DNA. You must have both. There could be dominance on one side or the other, but you need both of them to accomplish another human being. Figure that one out at a later point. We might come back and talk about it if you know what I said. Yeah, okay, the subcategories are called subclades. And without getting too crazy, because you could go into a whole, I'm going to tell you, we know for a fact that over the course of time, scientifically proven, DNA can change by way of either a mutation or what's called an SNP, and that can be living in a certain place for a long enough time, intermingling. DNA actually can change over time. So when we're looking at ancient cultures or we're digging up skeletons and we're looking closer to the source of the tree, you have a very good idea of where people actually came from. And in terms of migration, we can follow to some degree as we start to analyze DNA of modern people, we can start looking at their ancestry. Now, it's not bulletproof per se, specifically if you're looking at studies on DNA that predate 2010. A lot has changed in the technological understanding and the approach to how we get the DNA right. So older studies, I'd say, throw the baby out and the bathwater, they're just not good. Go to the more current studies and you'll find that, now back to my people here, you will find that if we are trying to analyze, remember I said DNA shows us from the grave site in Ashkelon, we have DNA that takes us back to Kaftar. Well, in the area of the Peloponnese, we have enough DNA evidence to bring us back to the area that these people basically came from. And we're talking about Egypt, and the respective territories thereafterwards that they were assigned to. So when you start putting this all together, I won't get into the details of subclades and what that, I'll save that for a festival or some other time. But what we're looking at by way of archeology, span by way of science, by way of every discipline possible, is that these people, the tribe of Dan people, not all of them, I'm gonna, I will keep saying this until you hear the rest of the message, but a sliver of these people obviously took off before the children of Israel went into Egypt's bondage, sailed off, and began spreading not only their name, but their DNA as well. And we've got good evidence for that. So when people talk about who are these people and the origins of people, is this to say that all the people of the Peloponnese and of the Aegean region all herald from this same haplogroup of DNA? Absolutely not. But specifically identified a large group of people, we have absolute certainty of where they have come from. Now, you put that in the pot with more evidence, and we'll do that in the next message to show more evidence I want to start first in the next message through the Bible because the Bible will actually give us some important clues about Dan before we even get sailed off onto the waters to some greater understanding about something. But as I said, this is a subject that, yes, it's fascinating and there's lots of information and people say, oh, it's too much for me. What I want you to see is that God said the seed will be 
you, you won't be able to count it. And if just the tribe of Dan alone, remember, okay, I'll give you this little tidbit to think about. We have every tribe's children chronicled. They kept great records right here. So the mystery is, when you look at Dan's offspring, there's only one child named, and yet they were as populous at one point when they were out of Egypt, they were as populous as Judah. Where did those children come from? Hmm. Well, if you want to know that, you're going to have to tune in and come back next week. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.